Thanks, David, for that uh, presentation. <laughs> Members and guests, uh, today it is my great pleasure to introduce to the meeting our guest speaker, Sarah Boko. Sarah is the director of the Neil Saxe Centre for Spinal Cord Injury Research at the South Australian, Inst South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute, as we all know as SAMRI. As mentioned in the club bulletin this week, Sarah has a background in marketing and strategic planning, having held senior roles in the medical imaging, telecommunications and mining sectors. Sarah was born in um, Karamulka, not that far over the Gulf, in a hospital which no longer exists, apparently. But most of her time was spent doing uh, working or living on a, a, her family's sheep station up outside of Bro Broken Hill. And she completed her secondary education as one of the first female boarders at Scotch College. And a lot of us have a connection with Scotch College. So that was an interesting point. Sarah returned to South Australia in 2017 after 30 years interstate and overseas. Neil Saxe is well known in South Australia, not only through the AFL connection, but also as through Rotary, as he was a member of Adelaide Parks. Is that right, Dave? Adelaide Parks Rotary Club, I think it was. And he did speak to our club a few years ago. Sadly, Neil has passed away, but his legacy was the creation of a research centre dedicated to spinal cord injury, now embedded at SAMRI. Members and guests, would you please welcome Sarah to the meeting. Thank you very much and thank you all for such a lovely welcome today. I'm delighted to be here and I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we meet and its traditional owners, the Ghana people, and pay my respects to their elders past and emerging. I'd also like to thank the President and Vice President today who's um, uh, hosting this event and the committee for welcoming me so warmly. Now normally you see a slide like this at the end of somebody's presentation and the reason it's here is that the Neil Saxe Centre for Spinal Cord Injury Research exists because of the fabulous sponsorship we have from some South Australian businesses and I want to say thank you to those right up front because that's really how come we can continue our work. Nature's Delight, Peter Hayes and Associates, Detmold Medical and the Hurley Hotel Group have been very instrumental in supporting our research work for many years. We're fortunate to receive some funding through Lifetime Support, which is a South Australian statutory authority that helps when people have received motor accidents, uh, injuries, and uh, require some support in that area, and also a global organisation called AO Spine. So many of you will know Neil, but I would like to start off by asking if there are any North Adelaide football followers here today. Terrific, okay. And what number was his jersey? Do you remember? Yes, thank you. And what about, what about Bulldog supporters? Anybody here prepared to say they're a Bulldogs, not a Crows supporter or a Power supporter? <laughs> We, we really know Neil and he became so well known in our community through his football days. Today is in fact a really important day. It's the anniversary, today is one year since Neil passed away. Neil suffered an injury as a 24 year old athlete playing for the VFL as it was known at that time. And it was a really amazing legacy that he then left from that time on for 49 years. He was 69 when he died last year, and would have been 70 in January. For 49 years, Neil committed himself to raising awareness about the lack of knowledge around spinal cord injury, and also raising funds for research to better understand spinal cord injury. Some of you will have attended some of the uh, many events that Neil hosted. There were ladies' lunches, uh, race days, 
dinners, uh, and I hope they uh, come back to mind with warm memories. About four years ago, the Neil Saxe Foundation took the decision to look to its longevity and to move across and become part of SAMRI. And as Rob mentioned earlier, that's where we are based today. The South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute on North Terrace, sited next to the Royal Adelaide Hospital, and between the Universities of South Australia and Adelaide Medical Schools, is in a prime position. And it's an amazing and impressive building. For those of you who've never had the opportunity to visit, to give you some background, there's over 800 scientists working in there and over 500 research projects. Our CFO just tears his hair out, you know, because each and every one of those has its own funding structure. So one of the things that's really uh, important here is to uh, look at the work of Mr. Slide. So I'm just going to slide forward there. There we go. Okay. So the research. The research that we're doing at SAMRI encompasses, we have three major research projects that we're running, which are part of over 20 projects on spinal cord injury in South Australia, between the universities, the hospital, and the research institutes here. We've got three major research projects one of them is called Project Discovery, one's called Project Bridge, and the last one is Project Skin. The individual standing there in that slide with the glasses on is our senior spinal cord injury researcher. His name is Ryan Doig. He comes from WA and he is a huge asset to our team. Project Discovery is all about trying to understand what's happening to a spinal cord that's the part inside the bony structure, what has happened to the spinal cord when an injury has taken place? And when you're a physician and you're trying to care for someone who's had an extreme injury such as this, it's a little bit like trying to pick a cloud out inside a foggy day. It's extremely difficult because you have an inflamed response, an inflammatory response, like a bruise forming around what is otherwise fairly invisible anyway. So for many people who suffer a spinal cord injury, it can be up to two years before their physician is able to advise them of their long-term prognosis. You can imagine the impact that this has on people and how difficult it is to live for that period of time not knowing what the outcome will be from your spinal cord injury. So our project is specifically using radioisotopes to identify and delineate the area of inflammation from the damaged spinal cord. Very technical, very specific, but incredibly important. And it will be a world first to be able to do this. So we're very proud of that. Just to give you an idea, we have a cohort of patients who are participating in our clinical trial, which has ethics committee approval. And these are people who generally have had an injury or are in their acute phase. We need to have examples of both. But for each of those scans that take place, costs over $6,000, just to give you an idea of the sort of investment involved. The next study we're doing is called Project Bridge. Project Bridge uses stem cells, and most people have heard of stem cells. But until I got involved with this particular project, I didn't know that you could get stem cells from your molar teeth. So this is actually a bit of a breakthrough because often when a person goes into an emergency environment, if there is a possibility of treating someone with stem cells, historically you needed to once again obtain ethics committee approval to use what was a human product from another person to treat the injured party. This is a game changer because this simply means that we could extract a molar tooth from a patient who's been injured, cultivate the stem cells, and then implant them into the spine to create regenerative neural pathways. To assist in doing that, what we found is the stem cells kind of give up the ghost when they get back into the body, even though they're our own. And only about 3% of them survive. So this particular study is looking at how can we make those stem cells work for longer and have more impact. And we've partnered with the University of Adelaide in their microengineering department who have developed this tiny, what looks like an old-fashioned disprin, 
a tiny micro scaffolding and we put the stem cells into the micro scaffolding, that gets implanted into the spine and that's how we're going to make a difference. So that's the work we're doing on Project Bridge. And then last but not least, the study that we uh, often get the most press attention is called Project Skin. C-I-S-C-I-N, Spinal Cord Injury Neurosexuality. And the reason for that is that when you speak to people who have a spinal cord injury, there are four things that they all say are their biggest priorities. They want to have improved hand function, if that's been a major loss for them. They want to have improved bladder control, improved bowel control, and much better sexual function. They are the four things that they look for to try to make their life as, as uh, effective and as uh, similar to the future and the past has been. So we are doing a study where we're imaging the brain to understand what is the connection between the brain and a sexual response. We, at, at a global level, this is very, very poorly understood. We have a burgeoning sexual health industry, which is great, and it's terrific that these topics are now being discussed more openly, but we really don't understand the science behind it. So this is a world first study as well. Not surprisingly, we're holding off putting a sign up at the university for our control subjects to participate. They'll get paid $120 to lie and look at an adult movie, so we think that uh, we'll wait until we're ready to go. Now, one of, the, um, one of the things you might notice in the middle of this slide, there's a picture of some sheep. Does anyone here live out near Gillies Plains? Have you ever been out? Have you noticed the sheep around the area? So that's a very important part of the research work that's being done. My, often people write to me and they say, oh, we found this fabulous discovery. It's been published in Science or we've seen it on the European news about a spinal cord, you know, miraculous cure. In mice, and, in mice and rats, and it is exciting. However, it's really unfortunate that the human spine does not respond in the same way as that of a mouse and a rat. As a consequence, we, it's very important that we have the opportunity to do studies on large-bodied animals. And those lovely sheep, and also in that space are some very large, very happy, big pigs, uh, the way in which we are able to take our research from the bench top to a clinical environment before we can then move it on into a human uh, trial. So those animals are very well loved. They actually grow nettles out there to feed the sheep because sheep apparently love nettles when they're not feeling well and they're extremely well cared for. And we're very fortunate to have that facility. I want to move on and talk a little bit about the facts and figures. Today in Australia, over 20,000 people will live with a spinal cord injury. There's approximately 270 cases per year, and that frequency has remained relatively static for the last 10 years. There was a significant amount of economic analysis done by Accenture in 2019 to better understand the finances and the financial impact on our economy as a result of spinal cord injury. And we were all shocked to discover that for the current 20,000 people living with a spinal cord injury, Australia bears a $74 billion lifetime expense. It's about $3.7 billion per annum to maintain, sustain, and enable this cohort of people. Now, clearly, if we could redirect some of those funds into research, we would be better off in the long run. So that's one of the reasons why the study was undertaken. It's very hard to read this, so I'm not going to expect you to do so, but I just wanted to share with you some other statistical information. The number of days that somebody with a spinal cord injury spends in a hospital spinal unit, which is extremely similar to an ICU bed. If you're a quadriplegic, it's between 30 days and 435 days. That's one month to 14 months is the spread. So you can establish pretty quickly that 
the bell-shaped curve there, you're going to have likely people in hospital from seven to about 10 months. It's a long time. And that's before they are then able to move out into a rehabilitation centre like Hampstead. For paraplegics, it's a lesser time, but it's, the impact is the same. It's a huge impact on people's lives, and we're working very hard to see if we can curtail that with our project discovery imaging, looking for that cloud within the fog. That would enable us to treat people in a different way and get them moving through, not the least of which would be a benefit for everybody concerned. The other thing, again, you may not be able to read it from where you are. This is, uh, this is an analysis of some of the data that's put together every year looking at what causes injuries and at what age are these injuries taking place. And the two major drivers of spinal cord injury are transport related, either land transport, which might mean you're walking down the street or you're on a scooter or a bike or in a motor car, or falls. They're the two major categories. When you look at the smaller categories such as horse falls, uh, football, water related incidents, you can count them on one hand. So the big drivers here are transport and falls. Transport is in this particular case of 19, uh, 2017 to 2018, we had 86 people who suffered major injuries as a result of transport, but 67 who suffered it as a result of falls. Now those falls are then broken down into two classifications, under a metre and above metre. Who can tell me, can anyone take a guess at the gender of the people who suffer the falls at a metre and below? And the gender of the, other, of the rest? Men. That is exactly the case. We're very, very fortunate here in Australia to have a very ageing, healthy population. And I'm certainly, you know, I think all of us are committed to that sort of lifestyle. But I implore you, please, pay someone to clean the gutters. Pay someone to prune your trees. Pay someone to paint the roof. Go and enjoy your savings and go travelling. Do the bash. Go skiing. Go hiking. Because it is just such an increasing revel um, in incidence of these falls related injuries. Um, it's really, it is a major issue. I would like to also just ask a bit of a random question here and you'll wonder why I'm asking this, but um, do you know at what age NDIS stops? So if you fall off that roof and you're over 65, you're on your own. There is, in fact, a campaign. If anyone wants to sign up, it's called Disability Doesn't Discriminate. I would recommend you get onto your local member and tell them it shouldn't, be, shouldn't stop at 65. <laughs> anyone who has a disability will, will, will present, know that. OK. So the reason I was asked here today was to say thank you. Last year, the Rotary Club of Adelaide provided $2,000 funding towards our bike ride. And this is our major fundraising exercise. Thankfully, it's almost COVID proof, almost. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. We were very fortunate to have your support for a particular individual who came along and rode with us. And if I may share with you a little story, one of our advisory committee members and former board member for the Neil Saxe Foundation is a very, uh, a very nice man called Jim Davies. Some of you may know Jim. Jim has a daily routine. He lives up at Blackwood and each morning he gets up and he goes walking early. And he decided he'd click, pick up uh, aluminium cans and plastic bottles on the side of the road and collect them so that his grandchildren could take them down to the recycling centre and understand at an early age how to, how to start raising money. Every day he was out there picking up these plastic bottles and cans. And every day, as he walked along past Windy Point, he'd go past this guy in, in Lycra, rain or shine, didn't matter, riding up the hill on his bike. I think I, to myself, I'm sure that the guy on the bike used to look at Jim and think, there's that nutty old guy out there again, you know, with his sack over his back, picking up, you know, funny old bloke. And the guy, and Jim, of course, would look at this guy riding up the hill and think, complete idiot. 
Who would, who would ride up a hill like this? One day, they stopped and talked to each other. And it turned out the guy riding the bike's name was Michael. They had never met. And Jim said to him, Michael, I'm involved in a cycling tour and it's a fundraiser and we need someone to go out and ride for three days. Uh, you'd be riding, we, we'll, we'll organise some accommodation and some meals for you. Michael just said, I'll do it. Just like that. That's Michael over there with sitting on the ground with his feet out in front of him. Michael Catt is just an amazing man. He uh, is a terrific athlete, he loves riding and he's been extremely um, proactive in supporting us but that's how he came to be the representative of Rotary in last year's ride. While I said it was COVID proof, what I should have said was it was almost COVID proof. Do you remember the pizza lockdown? So that was the weekend we were to have had our ride. So we quickly rescheduled and we moved it forward to February, which was fine, except if you can see the left picture there, if you have a look, that's a screenshot of someone's garment. We were riding out at the back of Barossa and it got to 44 degrees. I wasn't riding. The we, I use it loosely like the queen. Um, 44 degrees, so these guys were out there, they were riding hard and, and really, really uh, doing a fantastic job. There's a little picture there of a group of them clustered up together. And the, the uh, picture to the right, I think, tells a lovely story, which is we don't leave anyone behind. We have some very, very experienced riders on the tour who are fit and those who have a little bit more of a struggle getting up the hill. And you can see there one rider pushing the other up the hill. And that's very much Neil's philosophy. You mentioned earlier, um, or some people have mentioned remembering the incident when Neil actually had his injury. It was 1975. It was the year that colour television was introduced. It was also the year for football fans where we moved from the centre diamond to the centre square. That's a good trivia question for you. Neil collided with another, another player from the opposition on the field. That player was Kevin O'Keefe. He and Neil became incredibly good friends, family friends. And it's Kevin who started this bike ride. Kevin and his wife Maureen live in Melbourne and they got together with a whole lot of their friends and family from the Western Districts and they decided they were going to put on this bike ride, they were going to come over to Adelaide and ride across and the family will all come in a minibus and that's what the first Project Discovery ride was all about. We are now in our sixth year. And so it's a pretty special connection and a lovely way to link what had been a tragic incident into something that goes forward into the future. If any of you are Bulldog, clandestine Bulldog fans, I know you're not going to admit to it, the guy on the left-hand side there with the black glasses is actually Cole Boyd, uh, a very, very well-known Bulldogs footballer as well. So you can see this is a sort of uh, camaraderie that takes place. People have a lot of fun. They really do. One of the things about returning to South Australia was getting the opportunity to see it through fresh eyes. I grew up here, as Rob mentioned. I went to school here in Adelaide. And I came back to South Australia and was so excited. But I heard a lot of people saying, oh, you know, there's no jobs, there's nothing going on here. I've got to tell you, there is a huge amount going on in South Australia. It's a very exciting place to be, and I really, really encourage you to talk it up. Our kids need to hear that message. Our grandchildren need to know that there are careers here for them. And institutions like SAMRI are providing great opportunities for kids from a research standpoint. SA is great. I know that used to be an old one. Um, we do have great opportunities. Uh, and we're very excited to be able to continue to do this work here. This particular slide just really talks about the fact that um, we are doing work here that isn't being done in the rest of the world, and we do have unique skills and capability at SAMRI, which we'd really like to continue to develop. So the question now is, given that Rotary is all about impact, how can you make some impact? How can you make a difference? First of all, I noticed a few people taking photos. <laughs> if, you're, 
If you can post those on social media and, and tag the Neil Saxe Centre, that's always a great help. If you have the opportunity on your table, you'll see there's a little flyer with a QR code. We're all now QR code savvy. If you scan that, you'll be able to go through and make a tax deductible donation to any of the riders taking, place, taking part in this ride. And I know they'd appreciate it. Everything over $2 is DGR status one and you'll get a tax receipt. If you'd like to know more about becoming a partner with us, there's a little bit of information here. And I'd really like to invite all of you, when you're available, to come down and meet me at Samri. Come and have a look what we're doing there. It's extraordinary. The building itself is architecturally stunning. There is a public cafe inside the building, and Frank can attest to their coffees, uh, and maybe some of the rest of you as well. But thank you very much for your funding last year. I hope we can continue this relationship and I hope very much that some of you might be able to help and participate in some way with the ride as we raise more money for research. Thank you. We have time for a few questions, so Sarah's happy to, to answer a couple. Um, sorry. Anyone for a question? Don't all rush. <laughs> well, what? Oh. Heidi. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's fine. Thanks, Sarah. And um, uh, just wondered, um, did you know Neil personally? That's a really good question. Yes, I did. Yeah. I did. Because I, I remember when he spoke here uh, several years ago and um, I met him, had the photo taken bought his book, um, really, um, I don't know, there was something, it was a, a wonderful South Australian story to begin with, mm -hmm. and if you grew up in the areas, Neil grew up, Clearview and Broadview, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I live at Prospect, it, you know, I could just put myself in, in his shoes, um, and I'm just, so it was really sad when he died. And when he spoke to us several years ago, it was just the start of the Neil Sakshi Centre. And he, I remember really significantly him talking about um, how this two-year wait for people with a spinal cord injury to know what their life outcome was going to be um, uh, was one of his main aims of setting up this, uh, the research institute. So um, I know you touched on that and I just wonder now with the research that's been done, has that gap been, what's the gap closure? When do people, when they have such a severe spinal cord injury, how soon do they now know what their life expectancy is supposed to be? That's an excellent question and thank you very much. Um, just to build on your, uh, on your comments about Neil's childhood, I love the part in the book where he talks about his brothers and he playing football in the open paddocks and then picking the three corner jacks out of their knees after they'd finished in, in playing. Today, we are pretty much in the same situation from a clinical standpoint in terms of diagnosing injury and its extent. We are, this is why the research is so important. It takes a long time to get to the point where you're able to conduct a clinical program. You have to actually go through years of benchtop research at a cellular level, and then the animal studies, the ethics committee approval process, which can take up to 10 years. So we are making progress. At times, it feels glacial. It really does. And it can be very, very frustrating. Um, the COVID uh, impact, not the least of which, uh, was the fact that we had to suspend all clinical trials because we couldn't put anybody uh, who is immunosuppressed at risk of being close to a COVID testing centre. And unfortunately, the Royal Adelaide Hospital is the major testing centre in South Australia. It also happens to be where we would conduct the clinical trial. So we, you know, it is glacial. And I think that's really important to point out, thank you for that uh, reminder, is that Neil was frustrated that we are still using skin prick tests to understand the extent of a spinal cord injury, which they were using after World War I. We, we haven't had any major progress in that area. 
Um, so we, and it's a largely unfunded area from a research standpoint because it's relatively small. The financial impact on the community is huge, but it doesn't have the same numbers as some of the other disease groups, and as a result, it doesn't quite get the same allocation of funding. Mm. No, thank you, it's a good question. John Hunter, last question, I'd say. John. Oh, it's John Seaton, is it? Thank you. Uh, Rotary, um, at least in South Australia, and many other organisations sponsor medical research of one sort or another. And, I'm, and, I, and, and we all know that many other countries, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, everywhere, Oxford, um, all have research projects. Uh, uh, how do you know that people are not doing the same research that you are doing, say, in, uh, in Buenos Aires? And, and, what, and what blocks these days to the exchange of information um, between you and other universities or research centres? And what's the attitude of your medical, your pharmaceutical backers to you sharing, because a lot of money to be made for a successful yeah. program. What are, what are the roadblocks to, to knowing what other people are doing? That's a, thank you. Very, very thoughtful question. We have uh, an extremely well-connected research community globally. Thankfully, with internet and uh, well-established research portals where publications are placed, and in fact, a researcher is um, assessed not only on the number of publications that they produce, but also on the citations of those publications. And they are scored from their own industry or academic standpoint on those citations. So it's in their interest to put their research out into the public domain. We also, given it's a smaller research cohort compared to larger areas such as heart disease, it is easier for us to remain connected. But we're very, very much uh, a very close-knit community globally. The leading researchers here in Australia work with the leading researchers in England, in Switzerland, in other centres. In fact, our own Associate Professor Ruth Marshall, who is the head of Hampstead Rehabilitation, is currently the president of the International Spinal Cord Industry Association or Society. So we are very well connected here in South Australia. We actually look very hard to look to see where is our area of specialty. Let's not replicate. Let's do what we're really good at. And that's why we've got here in South Australia these imaging studies. Because we've got the facilities with the large animals and the imaging studies at Gillies Pains, and then the ability to be able to scan and inject with radioisotopes here at SAMRI and scan here at the Jones and Partners uh, Clinical Research Institute, we are able to do studies here that they can't do in major centres like Pittsburgh, where those institutions are blocks apart. So small is sometimes beautiful. And we're actually very, very lucky, and we're really trying to leverage that. The Neil Sachse Centre, uh, last year, due to the fact that we couldn't do clinical trials, one of my focuses was to look at what could we do together in Australia. So I set up a, a national organisation talking to the other research groups around Australia to say, how can we get together? What's your strength? What do you play well at? How, what could we do that helps each other out? So we're working on that as well. I'm conscious of the time frame. The only other thing I would add is, unfortunately, the work that we're working on at the moment is pre-pharmaceutical, which means, and it's much more about clinical management, which means that we don't have the interest of the drug companies if we are to, ch what we're working on still is trying to come up with a better diagnosis that will then le lead to interventions down the track. We'd love to get to that point. <laughs> Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. Oh, and last but not least, I did bring along some copies of Neil's book. Thank you for those of you who purchased it in the previous times, but if anyone would like one today, I'm very happy to gift them to you. Please come forward first in Best Served. Thank you.
Thank, thanks, Sarah, for your inspirational talk on the Neil Sachse Centre. It's, it's really great to hear it firsthand what is actually happening there, and, and it's pleasing to note that we have had some involvement with that initiative for the last few years. Um, we hope that you'll be able to continue, or we will be able to continue to support you in the years ahead. Um, in recognition of your uh, presentation today, it's customary for us to provide a certificate of appreciation to our guest speaker, and, uh, where, whereby we make a little donation to a, a charity. In this case, it is local community and youth projects. So thank you very much uh, for coming along, and please thank Sarah in the normal way.